Rajat Gupta was at a time one of the world's best known business leaders, a philanthropist and also an icon for generations of young Indians especially. And then came his moment of reckoning, a conviction for insider trading that changed his life and led to him spending several years in jail. He believes that at the time he never told his side of the story. That story is now out in a very honestly written memoirs, Mind Without Fear. It's a pleasure talking to you, Mr. Gupta. You know, when I read the first line of your book, your self-description, an orphan, an immigrant, a businessman, a leader, a philanthropist, and then you said a convicted felon, you know, and you said role model and convicted felon. And I just wondered how tough was it to describe yourself thus, to go from that juxtaposition, role model, convicted felon. It was less tough, tough than going through it, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was very tough. It was very tough. Um, the whole process, it was um, uh, quite deliberate how it was rolled out. Uh, it went on for a long time, whether they would do something or not, whether they would uh, charge me or not charge me. and uh, It was played out very well by the prosecutor. Oh. So it, in fact, one of the things that comes across in the book is that for a long period of time, you've been labelled without having been charged or right. having been tried. Right. So it was uh, at the Raj Ratnam trial, for example, it felt like a trial yeah. uh, on me and um, I had no possibility to defend myself. Oh. Uh, so the timing of it, when I was charged just before Raj Ratnam's trial, all of that I think was fairly well calculated, I'm afraid, by, by the prosecution. Now, ironically, the prosecutor or, or the man leading this case at the time was another immigrant, uh, or an immigrant background at least, Preet Bharara, high-profile prosecutor with political ambitions, um, who actually brings all of this at your doorstep on Diwali and later says uh, he didn't know the festival. What did you make of Preet Bharara's role in your entire experience? No, I don't know what to say particularly about him because I don't know him. Um, in general, though, I would say uh, I'll make a couple of observations. Oh. The first one is that in the financial crisis, there were real culprits, people who were culpable for crimes. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the prosecution, including Preet Bharat, couldn't get a single one of them. Oh. They were bankers, they were housing finance people, etc. None of them were convicted. Uh, they let banks go off with fines, which obviously the shareholders paid, but the management who were culpable were never oh. brought to account. So, uh, you know, in that sense, I would say that uh, it's unfortunate that um, he went after uh, someone like me with the uh, a great deal of passion and a great deal of calculation. Uh, that's one issue. But the other issue generally is that uh, prosecutors have unchecked powers and um, they often uh, misuse it, which is well documented in the U.S. system. One of the major problems of the U.S. justice system is uh, prosecutors uh, overusing their power. In your memoirs, the one argument you seem to be making, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you believe that you were guilty of misjudgments but not insider trading, and you continue to believe this. And could you speak to that nuanced difference? Because I think what you're speaking to is intent. I think what you're speaking to is the fact that you did not financially benefit, there was no quid pro quo, though it was alleged. Uh, later that you hoped to make money from Raj Ratnam. That is, that is what they said about you. And so <clears throat> when, I, when I read this book, what I'm looking at is a man saying, I wish I'd never known this man called Raj Ratnam. And I wish that had, you know, given that I knew him, I wish I'd never had that conversation with him. What were you thinking in your mind when you were having that conversation? So it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Insider trading law is a little bit murky, but the main principles are that there should be insider information communicated yeah. with the intent of making profit. There should be a, a quid pro quo or criminal intent 
and a quid pro quo arrangement and there should be some tangible benefit or tangible or intangible benefit. Um, in my case, there was, you could say, circumstantial evidence, mm. but there was absolutely no direct evidence. There was mm. circumstantial or hearsay evidence. There was no arrangement of any kind they couldn't cover, no quid pro quo, mm. zero benefit. I never traded, never received anything, none at all. But you had money in a fund together. We had a money in a fund together well before it was closed. It was lost because of he took out the equity. Mm. That was well before all these incidents. Mm. And in that point in time, I was not on very good terms with him because basically he had taken out his equity and the, the fund was vulnerable and it went down to zero. Mm. So uh, given that, I think they spun a wonderful story, entirely plausible but not true. Where do you think you went wrong? Because you do acknowledge in the book and later in <coughs> subsequent interactions, for example, with IIT students in the Bay Area, you made a public speech where you said you were sorry for letting young people down who, who, who used to look up to you. And you do write in your memoirs that it was inappropriate for you to have, or perhaps silly of you, if, if, if I may use that word, uh, for you to have shared the fact that Goldman was, uh, you know, considering uh, investing in a bank, in a private bank, taking over a bank. And... Later you made the argument, but this was being speculated upon in the public domain in any case. So you did not think it qualified as some piece of insider information. How and, do you look and, back and, at that and, conversation? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, no, the, the part of it which I think I should have never said, which is that this was a board discussion. Yes. The fact that I said, you know, Goldman was considering or I think Goldman might buy a bank. Those days you have to see the context. Every bank was considering merging with somebody else or buying somebody else and it was all over the papers etc as to who is talking to whom and mm. uh, so this and and by the way this was not insider information nor was there any trading done based on that nor was there any money ba based on that this was not one of the charges the reason that they put it up was trying to say okay i had a conversation like this and because they had no other recording. They had thousands of phone calls. They had mm. nothing that said, actually, I was passing out any information. Mm. Okay. So this is the only thing they had. They, therefore, they, they used it. Mm. And uh, yeah, I should have never said this was a Goldman board discussion. The other thing you got to realize. Uh, just, just to interject, how would you classify that lapse? Because you don't call it insider trading. How would you, what is the word or the category that you would use for, for what you shared? No, I should not let anybody acknowledge what the board discussion was. So it's it a confidential was discussion. Would you call it an indiscretion? Yeah, I would call it an indiscretion. It was a, you know, it's a, it was a kind of a way of saying it. I didn't think much of it, but it was... Careless. It was careless, yes. And I should never use the term. I, in any discussion, oh. I should not use the term, this was a board discussion. Right. All board discussions are confidential. Right. The other thing that is very interesting is that neither Goldman or PNG were part of Raj Ratnam's charges. Mm. He was never charged on that. Mm. So if the beneficiary of insider trading is never charged on it, you know, how is it that I'm charged on it when the main perpetrator is not charged on it? Mm. The other um, sort of circumstantial evidence that <clears throat> is used against you and one of your chapters starts with it, 16 seconds, that there was a 16 seconds gap between the decision of you know, Warren Buffett to bring in money into Goldman. You're at the board meeting, the board meeting ends, and 16 seconds later, you dial Raj Ratnam. And in the court, it was argued that you were tipping him off because wiretaps then showed that he was telling somebody else that I've got a good tip. He buys, he makes $800,000 in 24 hours. How do you look at those 16 seconds? So, you know, I don't know, you know lots of uh, senior executives and oh. people. Uh, I made phone calls 16 seconds after every board meeting, not just one. Oh. Uh, you know, you get out of a board meeting and by the way, I didn't make the call to him. I made the call to my secretary. So I made the call to my secretary say, you know, who is on my call list? Right. And in the morning I had a discussion with Raj Ratnam and he was supposed to provide me some papers by the end of the day and I asked on the him, fund that you were in together asked, Voyager yeah. yeah I asked my secretary you know did Rajatnam send the papers 
She said, no. I said, get me an address. You know, the fact that you come out of a board meeting and make a call is not unusual. In fact, Lloyd, in his testimony, uh, said, the, my lawyer asked him, do you make phone calls after board meetings? He said, yeah. Oh. Do you make them immediately after the board meetings? He said, yes. He fell himself into the trap of oh. saying, all busy executives make phone calls right oh. after they get out of meetings. Oh. You also write in the book that for, you know, what your legal team had to establish was that there could have been someone else at Goldman Sachs feeding Raj Ratnam as well. Yeah. And you do establish that trail, you do follow that trail, I don't want to give away the entire book. But why was the focus on you? Why did the focus remain so strongly on you according to you? Well, I, I, you know, I... No, no, I have to say the circumstantial evidence look bad. Look bad. So I don't I don't say that that's the issue, but you know, you have to look at it in an overall context. I was privy to corporate secrets for 40 years. Mm -hmm. It's not like this is the first time. Um, there's never been an issue on mm -hmm. my keeping confidences. There's never an issue of, you know, my wanting to make money through insider trading or anything close to it. So it's like, the second thing I would say is that, for example, I mean, think of it. Why would I? Because I, by, by that time, I was already in a tenuous relationship with Raj Ratnam because he had, I knew he had taken out money and, you know, I was trying to get the information. Why would I give him information for what? Uh, if you look at it from the other side, you know, Raj Ratnam is advising me to get off the Goldman board and join KKR. If I was his informant, yeah. give him Goldman secrets, why would he be saying, get off the Goldman board, go join a KKR? Hmm. You, um, as I say, you acknowledge carelessness, you acknowledge indiscretion, and you staunchly continue to argue in this book that you were misjudged and therefore, mis you know, your conviction is something that... I guess you will never make your peace with. You do write in your book that I, you know, I made my peace with what happened to me. I made, I made peace with my past. But you haven't clearly made peace with the central cataclysmic moment in your life, which is this conviction. You appealed it. You still got the same order. Um, how do you live with that? How do you live with the fact that you've been judged for something? See, one of the human things is if, you, if I feel I've done something wrong, it's easier to deal with the sort of approbation or the punishment that follows. But you are continuing to argue in this book that I, Rajat Gupta, am not guilty of insider trading. So how do you, how do you make peace with the conviction? Well, you know, I, the justice system, I've come to know the justice system. I've come to know the underbelly of the justice system. The justice system is not infallible. So my duty was to fight. I, it's Gita's philosophy. You oh. just, you know, you just work hard with the right intentions. I appealed every step of the way, every appeal I could do, and I lost all of them. Yeah. It's okay. I've done my very best. I'm completely at peace with it. The justice system is not God. You know, it's, it makes mistakes. And I know when I went to prison, I got to know many, many more mistakes that they, they make. And the incentives are misaligned in the justice system. Mm -hmm. Explain you know, the, that. The, the, look at it. It's the, the prosecutors generally are political animals. They have political ambitions. They're all about winning, mm -hmm. not about searching the truth. Mm -hmm. What do you, if you had to answer to your conscience and you had to be your own judge, what are some of the things you feel you did wrong? That you would, let's just forget the justice system for a moment. What did you, Rajat Gupta, do wrong? I already said that, you know, one of them was, you know, I should share the said, board, re reference the board. Yeah. Um, you know, wrongs of things of judgment, right? I resigned from the Goldman board. I should have stuck with it. And fought? No, no, I should have stuck with it and not gone back. All right, okay. You know, Goldman begged me to come back mm -hmm. because of the financial crisis going on. If I had not got back, nothing would have happened. Zero. Uh, so there were a series of things that, you know, decisions I made or judgments I made that in hindsight mm. looks like I shouldn't have made them. Your family, your wife, your daughter <coughs> had warning bells about Raj Ratnam. What, did, what were they sensing that you were ignoring? No, I think 
you know, I grew up in the consulting world and oh. a firm like McKinsey, which is, is a wonderful firm, great values. Um, the financial world is a lot more cutthroat world. It's a different, you know, we're... Yeah, yeah they're, no, uh, they're not necessarily good guys. No, no, I, I just, it's a different world. It's a different world. I'm not, I was never used to it. And um, in that sense, uh, you know, they sensed that that was a world that was, I was unfamiliar with. And uh, don't know whether I had the the kind of, you know, what do you call it, the sixth sense to deal with. How, that's, that's one thing. But um, you asked about Raj Ratnam, you know, you have to say that he is he's, he's a complicated person, just like many of us yeah. are. But while, you know, he did do some things that I wouldn't condone. But on the other hand, I must say, he uh, was offered five years of reduced sentence to testify against me. And he said, no. Think about that for a minute. That's, that's uh, mm. extraordinary yeah. when you have an 11-year sentence and you offered five years off for testifying. And he says, I have nothing to say. He didn't do anything wrong. I'm not. And I remember reading his interview to uh, Suketu Mehta where he makes this argument that they kept t asking me to cut a deal yeah. to actually wear a wiretap and record his conversations with you. And he says he said no. Yeah. Would you, once he comes out of jail in 2021, do you see yourself sitting across the table and having a civil conversation with Raj Ratna? No, I met him in jail. We had a civil conversation. And how, and how did that conversation go? Quite well. I mean, I, you, there's no rancor that you feel towards no, him. No, no, I don't feel any. I mean, he. You don't feel he's the one who landed me in this mess. No, no, he did. He did. I told him that. I said, "You're the reason I'm here." We were. We met in jail. I said, yes. "You're the reason I'm here." Uh, at the same time, I also said, "I. I appreciate. Many others would have relented and taken the deal, and you stood your ground, and I really appreciate mm. that." And one of the people who did take a deal was Anil Kumar at McKinsey, who considered one of your protégés, somebody you mentored, somebody you went out of your way to help, um, including his son, who had other disabilities that he was battling. And Anil Kumar takes the deal to basically turn on you. How did you wrap your head around that? It was a strange thing because Anil Kumar knew nothing about this case. Mm -hmm. He didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. So he was you know, forced by uh, the prosecution to testify. Again, to kind of confuse the case because literally Anil had no knowledge of any of this. So he should not have in a, in a way been a witness. He should have said no, but he couldn't say no. Now, you know, do I feel that he should have put his foot down and said, no, I, don't, I know nothing about the case, so why are you asking me to testify? Mm -hmm. I think that's what he should have done, whether they would have let him do that. And... See, this is part of the system that I think is flawed. I mean, you literally capture that person and say, you do as I say. Mm -hmm. You know, talk about Anil. Lloyd Blankfein was rehearsed for hours and hours by the prosecution. Mm. They had to admit to that in the court mm. to say precisely what they wanted them to say. Because the board meeting in que October in question was about their firing 10% of the people. So it was nothing to do with quarterly results or nothing at all. But the prosecution wanted him to say, oh, I don't remember whether we discussed financial results or not. We didn't. It was about uh, yeah. uh, firing of people. Mm. but. Please say that it is my practice to do so normally. <laughs> so that they can confuse the jury about, oh, you know, right. that's what he... Right. So. <clears throat> Prison time. Yeah. The book opens with an incident over a shoelace that lands you in, you know, solitary confinement. It sounds absolutely bizarre. I mean, uh, you know, convicted rapists don't get solitary confinement. Well, mostly it's terror-related cases or really heinous crimes. How did this not break um, your mental cohesiveness, your prison, your years in prison, and how did they change you? Well, you know, I think 
Given my own father's history, I had... Yes, you wrote about his, him going to prison in the freedom years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you know... I don't but that know, was a different backdrop. You know, a completely different backdrop. But it gave me the sort of, in a sense, inspiration through the stories I'd heard from him saying, yeah, prison. Firstly, I felt myself like oh. a political prisoner. I mean, I'd done nothing wrong. In my eyes, I'd done nothing wrong. My destiny to go to prison. Oh. Okay? Let me make the best of it. So people who would say that, look, your father went to prison as a hero yeah. and you went to prison as, 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 as a villain or as a disgraced person. Yeah. That was not your self-image. You, yeah. you, you felt a political prisoner, i.e. you felt a victim of a system. system. Yes, yes, I did. But I didn't kind of think of it as saying, oh, I'm a victim, you know, feel sorry for me, etc. That's not, you know, I fought my battles. I lost. Yeah. Now I'm going to prison. So my, my view of the thing is, okay, I'm going to make the best of it. Both physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, every way. Mm. And it was an extraordinarily learning experience. I mean, uh, I went to solitary confinement three times. This was the middle one that started. Uh, I went for seven weeks later. Uh, I read the Gita six, seven times over from cover to cover. Uh, I reflected on, and I learned a lot. I, when I was in prison, I did many things. I helped others as much as I could. I wrote letters for them. I started book clubs. I, you know, helped people who could not have their families visit them because they had no funds. So I could, I, I tried, I created a commissary in my own uh, little, this thing. I bought all the OTC medicines you could buy from and made it available to the whole group. Uh, I did all I could. There were, there, were no, there were no monstrous, terrible days? There were no days of, I'm losing it here? No. Not even one? Not even one. Ex so how, how do you explain that? Because, well, you know, you went from the high life into prison. You didn't go from an ordinary life. You went from being corseted and, you know, feted and celebrated to this. What is interesting is one of the things, one of the great lessons of Gita is detachment. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I, I was a little bit forced to, but I accepted the detachment, right? I, 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 I resigned from everything I was involved with the day I was charged. Bill Gates asked me, please don't resign. You are innocent till you're proven guilty. I don't want you to resign. Okay, I said, fine. But then it was clear when he oh. came to India that people were asking him, why isn't he resigned? Exactly. Yeah. And, and here's the problem with the, you know, this whole business about you're innocent till you're proven guilty. Doesn't actually work. Doesn't actually exist. Yeah. You're guilty until you can prove yourself innocent. Yeah. And uh, in this case, it's very difficult to prove a negative. How do you prove I didn't mm. pass on information? How do you prove that, you know? Um, anyway, but you back to the prison, um, there were there were a couple of things in my favor. One was that I had a relatively short sentence, so I could see the end of the tunnel. It was not like 10 years, 15 years, and you see. So that gave you, you know. It was finite. It was finite. Cool. And, and second, I found it quite interesting. I, I made my life very interesting. I um, worked hard on, I used to walk 10 miles a day. I would take notes in the each of the cases of my prisoners, I interviewed 40 prisoners on what their char, what their life was before, what their etc. I did work on the criminal just, justice system. I'm a consultant, so I drew up a big chart on what the issues in the criminal justice oh. system were. I, I made a decision tree. I looked at issues that I still have them, and I'm working on. Right? So now that you're out of prison, would you still keep up with some of these people some you met in jail? Yes, I do. Yeah. How did uh, life change for you? One of the things you say is that, you know, somebody said to you, you're going to find out who your true friends are. And not everybody was a true friend, though many people were. And I don't know if I was applying like a Desi lens on this, but it seemed to me that many of the people who stuck by you were actually the Indians. There were many Indians who stuck by me. There were some Indians who didn't. Uh, you mentioned Adil Zainal Bhai. No, uh, you know, Adil's still a friend of mine. We, we but he's, he's in the book as someone who... You, you felt let down. Yeah. It's something which I was disappointed about. 
it's not you mm. know I don't want to make it such a big thing about it it's not uh, mm. I try to be honest in the book sure. and so it's uh, how it is who did you feel most let down by well I you know I would in a way I would rather not talk about I've written already about few of the situations yeah. but I, I'm not a person who holds grudge I, obviously what really hurt you was was the you know being sort of ousted from the McKinsey alum community and losing that email yeah you know when when you've been I worked there for 37 years I never worked anywhere else in my life mm -hmm. you know and so it was a it was very hurtful it was uh, to me a big shock that uh, and and this was while they are a value driven firm so here it is you know there's one of the principles values and humanity is you're mm -hmm. you're innocent till you're proven guilty okay. yeah Another value that McKinsey cherished and 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 should cherish is their partnership. Mm -hmm. So you know how do you how do you kick a partner of thirty seven years mm -hmm. when they're down? Yeah. What for? Mm -hmm. And all of this had nothing to do with McKinsey. Zero. I mean, I retired already. Mm -hmm. So it was not like this is uh, you know I was there in McKinsey and I did something bad. Mm -hmm. So I, I was I was very hurt and surprised and uh, by that, uh, but there are many people in McKinsey who are very close to me still. Was it also difficult to leave? So, you know, so many of these institutions, philanthropic institutions, the Indian School of Business, Public Health Foundation of India, I'm naming two in, in you know within India itself. Yeah. Um, these were in a sense your babies. Yes. And you know, yes. you had to sort of. Let that, go. That's okay. That I think was a great lesson. You know, you have to learn how to detach yourself. Mm -hmm. I didn't create these institutions for my, you know, reputation building yeah. or glory. It's much more to do with that was the right thing to do. You create something. I always created something in a model where there were multiple people who should step up to the leadership. And, you know, yes, I withdrew from them. And I'm again involved. I, you know, I met with the dean of ISB yesterday and talked about what's going on and gave him some advice on what he should do. Uh, I was chairman for the first 10 years. I don't need to go back to the board or be chairman or anything like that. Mm. So this, this thing about detachment comes back again and again to me. It's, you know, you, you, have to be, you have to be able to let go. Oh. But at the same time, you should, you know, they are my babies. I I want to make sure that they do well, do well, and I'll do everything in my power to continue to do so. You 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 know, um, you sound like you have internalized that detachment when I when I read the book. Uh, but now that you're out of prison, you've served your sentence, your appeals you've lost. What is this, as you say, the 80th decade of your life lies ahead for you? How difficult has been the road back? to the life you once knew? Well, I'm not sure the life I once knew or led is the life I want to lead. So what I is mean, that life so that you want to, want to you live know, now? Firstly, I mean, you know, I was very busy. If anything I would change would be the, the extraordinary business and, and uh, so I... And I, your daughters and your wife would keep telling you just yeah, let so go a bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. get off the treadmill. So, you know, if I look at the last three years, I've spent a lot of time with my family. Um, I have spent some time uh, traveling, you know, reconnecting with friends. Um, I have spent some time thinking about some of the issues that are important to me and getting involved in some new initiatives in public health, in prison reforms, etc. And I spent a lot of time writing this book. It wasn't easy. I mean, you know, it's. Uh, did you ever did you ever sort of wrestle with how honest you wanted to be while writing it? No, I I only wanted to write it if I could be completely honest about it. Uh, I didn't want to write. A, but was it painful? Was it painful uh, to write? Of course, of course it was. Of course it was. Um, I didn't want to. You know sugarcoat anything. Mm. Uh, I wanted my readers to feel uh, 
what I was going through, the emotions I was going through. And the reason I wrote it, I say it in the book in the beginning, is that um, it's, to me, it's more for young people to kind of figure out what a life, an interesting life, and they can see parts of it. Everybody can relate to some part of it and mm. to think about their own learnings mm. from that. And so the preface it, actually references you being at a tennis, a tennis match and young sort of, I think, Indians mm. walking up to you and, you know, being, you know, wanting a photograph with you. And you're, you're sort of realizing at that moment that these young people who looked up to you, yeah. they have a right to understand yes. Yes. what happened. Exactly. And why it happened. They do. And the other interesting thing what came through there, which I was so moved by, is they cared about how I was doing. They really kind of, I hope you're doing well. I mm. hope you're feeling well. Um, I mean, they don't know me, but they cared about me. You know, it, it was very clear. Mm. So I want, I want to tell those people, you look, you can judge from reading the book how I'm doing, what I'm feeling, and what I will do. But I hope you draw some your own lessons and your own inspirations from my life. There's this sort of Sinatra-esque uh, line somewhere in the book which says, I have regrets, but not too many. Um, that's what you write. What is perhaps your biggest regret? Standing here today, looking back, looking ahead, what is your single biggest regret? Well, I mean, there are regrets in a... In, 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 in a broader or, sense, in a, sure. or in a specific sense. I mean, the regrets in the broader sense are more to do with, you know, in hindsight, I did too many things, perhaps. I was very stretched. And it was, I was seduced by the fact that I could add value in a lot of things. Mm. I mean, in a very short period of time. Would, would you call that, a, would you think that people who are very successful and very wealthy are in danger of having an inflated sense of self? I, I don't know that it necessarily... Did you suffer from that? I, I won't say it's inflated sense of self. It is, it was proven by the marketplace in this sense that, you know, people would seek me out for advice, okay, and I would give them the time, mm -hmm. whether they're building an institution or they're doing something else, and they would find it very valuable. So it's not so much that I couldn't contribute and I, you know, I was... It's more that I was pulled because I had a capability, this, this is immodest to say, but I had the capability of bringing people together. I had the capability of build, bringing people together from multiple sectors. I mean, the NGO world loved me. I worked a lot oh. with them. The global health community, the business community, you know. So the ability to bring a lot of people together for the common cause and to do something meaningful and impactful uh, is, a, is a skill I developed over years and I was reasonably good at it. So people asked me, got me involved in many different mm. projects. It resulted in a, I don't know whether um, you know, you've looked at, no you haven't, but my calendars were ridiculous. I mean, you know, they were just ridiculous, it didn't make any sense. Mm. Uh, and that's why when all so this it becomes happened, that addiction of constantly like yeah, just the adrenaline yeah adrenaline of uh, yes constantly being on the go so that, that that is one and then a specific regret as I said I I wish I had testified why 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 didn't you testify I, I think that's something we didn't speak about you know and your lawyers your yeah, exasperation yeah, with your legal team yeah. comes through as well they advised you not to they um, constantly advised me not to they didn't really prepare me. It was perfunctory, the preparations we were going through. The government case was rolling on and I felt honestly more and more despair because I didn't have a plan. They didn't have a plan. And why didn't you change your lawyers? Just No, you can't change the lawyers in the middle of... You know, uh, that's when it's already on. It's, it's and they didn't pay enough attention to the, uh, to the see, wiretaps they, either. Yeah, yeah, but they, they you know, the governments, they were, they millions of pages of evidence. I mean, you know, you can't get, I mean, the, you cannot imagine, think about it, the legal fees was $60 million. So, you know, it's not like a, uh, I mean, yeah. 
it's it's crazy. You can't. I could have changed my lawyers early on, but it was too late by the time. I'm not we... sure. I, you know, I think they got outwitted in terms of the the legal strategy by by the prosecutors, and so by the time that you know it came for the decision, I I was feeling particularly you know vulnerable because I thought the case was going terrible, mm -hmm. and um, and then they said, no, no, you should definitely not testify. And in fact, if you testify and if you lose, I, I thought I was mm. going to lose by that, by that time. He said, uh, you'll get a stiffer sentence. And this, I mean, it was kind of like, you know, here I'm, I'm hiring what I think is one of the best law firms and one of the best lawyers. And he's advising me every day, constantly. He'll say, oh, it's your decision, but I would advise you not to. Yeah, sounds um, that exasperation has come through in the book. Finally, uh, Mr. Rajat Gupta, you you said that you know young people, you'd want them to learn to, to you know they were inspired once. You'd want them to learn that's life. It's 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 a mix of many moments. What is the learning you'd want people, young people, IIT graduates looking to go to Harvard like you did, looking to make a mark in the business world, looking to launch their own startups? you know, people who've acquired early wealth at a very young age. What would be your words of advice to them? What did you learn that you'd want them to know? Well, there are many things. First, you know, uh, it's, there are lessons from the early years in terms of really being uh, in a learning mindset, becoming a better professional. That was what, getting yourself out of your comfort zone mm. uh, time and again. That's what I did at McKinsey, and okay. I think that was the source of my success in McKinsey. You know, being able to work through others, making other people successful, that develops the trust that people have. The reason I got elected head of McKinsey is not because of my anything other than people trusted me. My partners trusted me, that's why they elected yeah. me. Um, so that trust in human beings and that trust in that caring to make them successful is a lesson I would draw. You know, things like there is life beyond your job. Do something much beyond your immediate assignment. You know, 25, 30 years ago, I started working on causes that I didn't have to do, but yeah. but I felt this is a, you know, I've learned something. I want to to bring that skill, not only to be successful in a particular job or successful as a career, but I want to bring that skill mm. to be impactful in society. And one of the biggest things was to bring, you know, management type thinking, business type thinking in the not-for-profit world. Mm. It needs it, you know. The sense of, I've talked about this, the sense of, you know, karma yoga, which is you don't worry about the results. Just do, do what you think is right. And once you do that, it's a completely liberating philosophy. You don't, some you win, some you don't win. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference. And then this sense of detachment, this kind of action with detachment. That's another teaching that comes out of Gita. It's, you know, you act, but you're detached. And I think that would have helped you and kept you in great stead in these very difficult years of your life. It I has. think without detachment, you wouldn't have managed to make it in one piece. It's a fascinating book, Mind Without Fear, Rajat Gupta's memoirs. Thank you, Rajat Gupta, for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you.